All right, so I'm George Wilson. I'm from uh, Data61, which is part of CSIRO. We're in the Queensland Functional Programming Lab. We're doing Haskell all day, and it's awesome. And I'm here today to talk about type classes, which are a, uh, which I'll, I'll get into what they are. I think they're very cool. So what are type classes? Type classes are a language feature that some languages have. They are, here are some of them, or perhaps all of them, I don't know, but Haskell, PureScript, Etta are all fairly similar languages, and they have type classes. And this other language, Clean, actually has type classes, although I don't know anyone who's ever written any Clean. Um, sometimes type classes aren't a language feature. Sometimes we use them as a kind of a design pattern in a language that doesn't support them, such as Scala, and we'll get into that later on. So before I tell you what type classes are and why I think they're a really compelling solution to this problem, I'd like to describe what the problem is. Well, not so much problem, but what we're kind of doing with them. What we're doing is polymorphism. So polymorphism is it, it's a Greek word, something which is polymorphic, has many shapes. And when we use polymorphism to describe a type, what we're saying is that type can kind of take on many forms. It can take the form of other types, and it's, it's in some sense kind of abstract. It can, it can behave at different types. So there are a few different uh, there are a few different forms of polymorphism that we'll see, and polymorphism is good, I think, right? It's it'll lead to less duplication in our code, more reuse, and many other benefits. I don't have time to talk about. I hope you agree that polymorphism is good because I don't have much time to justify it. Uh, so, broadly speaking, I'm going to say that there are two major forms of polymorphism used in programming. People will argue with me about this, but I said broadly and I said major, so hopefully that weasels it out enough. Uh, parametric polymorphism and ad hoc polymorphism. So what's parametric polymorphism? So a parametrically polymorphic type has at least one type parameter which can be instantiated to any type, right, any type in the universe. So here I've given an example, in, this is in Haskell, this is a Haskell type signature for a function called reverse. And reverse takes a list of A's and produces a list of A's. <coughs> And in this case, A is, is parametrically polymorphic. It, A could be instantiated to any type. So I could reverse a list of integers, a list of strings, a list of whatever else I have lying around, a list of bananas. And, um, and the reverse function doesn't care what's in the list. It doesn't work with any of the elements of the list. All it does is reverse their ordering. Right? So this is an example of a type which is parametrically polymorphic. And that's all I'm going to say about parametric polymorphism. There are some incredible talks out there about it, um, and I can tell you which ones they are later on if you'd like. But today I'm interested in ad hoc polymorphism. So an ad hocly polymorphic type can be instantiated to some different types, but it will have a, a sort of a different behavior at each type. Uh, so I've given an example here of equality. So this is sometimes sort of, well, this is quite related to operator overloading, if you've if you're familiar with that. Um, so, so with the example of equality, we can compare certain things for equality, and it will be quite a different implementation. The way we would compare two integers for equality is very different to the way that we would compare two strings or arrays for equality. With the integers, we'll defer to some CPU instruction that will compute their equality. And with an array or a string or something, we'll have to kind of loop through and check character by character to make sure that these are the same, that these strings are, are equal. Uh, and, and also, not everything can be compared for equality. For example, lots of classes of functions can't be compared for equality. Um, I, I'm, I'm talking about actually, not what Java or some other language does. Right? But, um, uh, so, so this is an example of an ad hocly polymorphic type. And that word, ad hocly, that's really, that's atrocious, isn't it? And I wanted to think of how else I could phrase this sentence, right, other than ad hocly, because that's horrible. So I asked the source of all human knowledge, Twitter, and I said, so if the reverse function is parametrically polymorphic, is the sum function ad hocly polymorphic? And we had quite a good discussion about it, and some, well, some good points were raised. And I think the conclusion we've drawn is that we say that something exhibits ad hoc polymorphism. So that's how I'm going to phrase it from now on, so that I can avoid saying ad hocly. And this has kind of given me a bit more faith in Twitter. Because a lot of the time, it's just this. <laughs> right? Cause, 
that's just, I'm looking at that all day, every day, man. And then it turns out, though, that Twitter can be this. <laughs> so now let's look at some language features from different languages which give us ad hoc polymorphism. The first one we'll look at is interfaces, which are found in Java or C Sharp or, or many similar languages to those. Here's an interface. This interface is called equal, and it says that if I'm an object and my class implements the equal interface, then I can be then I have a method eek, which takes another thing and tells me whether it's and returns a bool indicating whether those two things are equal. Here's a class, it's called person. A person has two attributes, an age, which is an int, and a name, which is a string. And now I'm going to say persons can be compared for equality with other persons. And the way we do this is very straightforward. We compare the two ages, and we compare the two names, and if those are the same, that is actually the same person. And interfaces are really cool, because we can define a method. So here's a method called element of. And uh, element of takes an A and a list of A's, and it just tells me whether that A is in the list. In order to be able to do that, I need A to extend equal, to, to be comparable for equality, so that I know whether it's in the list or not. And so in the body of the function, you'll see I'm calling the eek method, which is from that interface. And this is really cool because it doesn't say anything about persons, right? It doesn't say anything about integers or names or anything. It'll work for anything that implements this equal interface. And so this one function will be very, very reusable. And that's extremely useful. So interfaces are looking pretty good. What if I want to compare some strings for equality? That seems like something I might come up against, right? Let's go and do that. So here's java.lang.string. And I'm just going to change it to implement my interface. But I can't do that, right? I'm not Oracle. I can't go and change java.lang.string. <laughs> yeah, yeah, please, please don't swear at me while I'm giving a talk. <laughs> so, so this is kind of an inflexibility of interfaces, right? I can't... I can't go and add my interface to somebody else's type. That's kind of a problem. And now I'm interested in linked lists. So here's a linked list. It's got four, five, and one in it. Um, let's write a linked list type. So there's going to be some implementation in there. Who cares? But it's a class called list, and it's a list of A's, because we've got, we're, we're going to be polymorphic. We're going to say, I, I don't care what I'm a list of. Uh, and there'll be some implementation in there. And now let's make lists comparable for equality with other lists. It's very easy to compare lists for equality. What you do is you go through the elements of the two lists, one by one, and you make sure that all the elements are equal. And if all the elements are equal, then the two lists are equal. And if they have the same length and that kind of thing. So let's write the code. So here's my eek method, which is part of my equal interface. So given another list of A's, let's compare ourselves to equality. But we can't because we don't know that A implements that interface. So we're stuck. We can't even compare lists for equality. That's not too good. So interface implementation, as we've just seen, can't be conditional. So I can't say, I have the eek method so long as the A type has an eek method. And if it doesn't, then I don't. And also, we can only implement interfaces for types that we control. I can't go and change java.lang.string. As the gentleman said over there, this isn't Ruby. <laughs> so let's look at a principled solution to this problem. Type classes. Yeah! All right, that's what the talk's about. <laughs> so here's a type class in Haskell. Type classes are given by the class keyword. It's nothing like the class keyword from Java or C Sharp or whatever you've seen. In this, the class keyword gives a type class, which is more similar to an interface than it is to a class. And this, uh, this type class is called equal, and it says A is equal if I can give this method eek, which has the type, given two A's, produce a bool. Here's a person data type in Haskell. This just says a person has an age which is an int and a name which is a string. 
And now we can give what is called a type class instance for the equal type class for the person type. And to do that, we just define the eek method. We check the two ages are the same, check the two names are the same, and if they are, that is the same person. And now we can write an element of method, which takes an A and a list of A's and produces a bool. And this double shafted arrow here, this says that A, this is called a type class constraint. This says that A must have an instance for the equal type class. So we can go through our list and determine whether that A is in the list. So this is really cool. The other really cool thing about type class instances is that instances can themselves have type class constraints. So this says there is an instance of equal for list of A so long as there is an instance of equal for A. So we can go through lists and compare them for equality. And that's very cool, but there's something else very cool about this slide, which is that's the built-in list type. I didn't define that list. That comes with Haskell in the base library. So I've just added a type class instance for my type class for a type that I didn't write, that I don't control. It's in some other library. And that's extremely cool. So type classes give us the ability to write instances for types that we didn't write, and other people can write instances in their code for my types, if they have a type class I don't know about or something like that. And, um, and instances can be conditional on other instances, which lets us kind of think more thoughts. It lets us kind of cover more of the design space and get into more interesting things. So I think that they're kind of more, a bit more expressive than, than interfaces and a bit more modular. Right? I don't have to go and change java.lang.string to make my program work. Now, they're not... 100% flexible, it's not a free-for-all, we have some restrictions. I'll tell you what they are in a minute. But the reason we have these restrictions is to enforce something called type class coherence. Informally, I don't have time to go into a formal definition, and I would probably get it wrong, but it's out there. Uh, informally, it basically means for a given type class, for a given type, there are zero instances, or there is one instance, and nothing else could be possible. That's all. There is zero or one of these things. No matter how you ask for an instance, you will always get the same one. And if an instance exists, you can't not get it if you ask for it. So you can't forget an import and then miss your type class instance, or you can't reorder your imports and have something wrong go happen. So we, we have some way to kind of understand what's going to happen with these. It, it's, it's a really useful property because it, never, it doesn't do anything unexpected. Either your code kind of does what you expected, or it doesn't compile, which is really useful. I like that property. So here are the restrictions. I hope you'll agree that they're minor. Um, there are exactly two places a type class instance is allowed to exist if it exists. So here we've got a person.hs Haskell file and an equal.hs Haskell file. And we can give a type class instance for the equal type class for the person type, either in the file that defines the type, in this case person, or in the file that defines the type class, in this case equal. So you still have to have control over one of those modules, but not, it's not a particular one, it's either one. So this is an example of breaking type class coherence, or a, something which could potentially be used to break the coherence. This is called an orphan instance. And an orphan instance is an instance which is defined not in those two files, the file that defines the type and the file that defines the type class. And orphan instances can be used to break coherence. So we generally disallow them. And I'll come back to that later in the talk. So type class coherence kind of benefits my sanity when I'm writing programs. Um, the thing I expect to happen happens. Instances can never depend on my imports or the ordering of my definitions or, or, or anything kind of like that. It, there's zero or one, and I will always get it if it exists. Right? And there's, it's just this nice kind of plumbing that's done behind the scenes for me. And it can't go wrong. So a lot of the time, there's, the people say, say, oh, this language is great. It's got this plumbing that you don't have to worry about. But then the plumbing will do the wrong thing. And then you'll either, either it'll be difficult to, to get in there and make it do the right thing or impossible. But with type classes, there's like only one thing that can happen, and like it does. So you don't have to worry about the plumbing behind the scenes going wrong. 
There are some things that are ruled out by type class coherence that we might want, though. So, for example, we can't do custom local instances. So imagine if I wanted to compare two persons for equality differently in some corner of my code for a special purpose. Um, and I can't have multiple selectable instances. So, for example, we might want to, we might want to change our imports to get access to a different instance or something like that. Those, these things are ruled out by type class coherence. We have solutions to these things that maintain type class coherence, um, but I don't have time to get into them, so uh, talk to me afterwards about that. But these are some kind of, they seem like they might be useful things. And they're kind of ruled out by this, by this sort of strict property of coherence. So I want to look at a system that doesn't rule those things out. It's called implicits. And they're found in the Scala programming language. And implicits are more flexible than type classes. So what are implicits? Before I do that, here's a person data type. This is a data type definition in Scala. It's given by the case class pair of keywords. And this is a person with an age, it's an int, and a name, which is a string. And here I can define a trait. This trait is called equal. And it, it, to implement this trait, you'll have to give a definition of eek, which has the type given an a and another a produce a boolean. And now I can make an implicit definition of a value of type equal person, where I give that method. Here we're using the implicit keyword to mark this definition as implicit. The implicit keyword has another usage, which we'll see on the next slide. It, it has two different usages. So here's our element of function, which takes an a and a list of a's and tells you whether that a is in the list. And here we have a second parameter of type equal a, and this parameter is marked as implicit. So this is the second usage of the implicit keyword in Scala. And what this does is if you call this method and you leave off that implicit parameter, and there is a definition in scope with the correct type, which is also marked as implicit, that value will be passed to this function implicitly. <laughs> So we're using this quite similarly to how we use type classes. And we can define in implicits, which depend on other implicits. So in this case, I'm using the implicit keyword on one line for both of its usages, both to mark a definition and to mark a parameter. So this says, given that a's have an implicit equal, I can give a list of a an implicit equal. And once again, that is the built-in Scala list. Right, so I've won. I can, I can go and give inst uh, implicits for other data types that I don't control. That's very cool. So we have these similar advantages to, we, to what we had with type classes. We can define implicits for types we didn't write. We can write implicits that depend on other implicits. So this is looking like a pretty good solution. And unlike type classes, we have no restriction on orphan instances, and we have no restriction on the number of instances. So we can really go to town. This is, this is a lot of power, right? Let's get ready for implicits. So these things seem to be more powerful, sort of more flexible and more modular than type classes. Imagine if I didn't, def if I didn't control either of the packages defining the type or a type class. I could still give an implicit for it. Or if I wanted multiple selectable ones where I just changed my imports or something, I have the power to do that. Let's go through another example. You must be getting sick of persons. Uh, this is an ordering. It's a, a sum type, which means that an ordering is either less than or equal to or greater than. Here I've abbreviated them. And, uh, and th this is just saying, so imagine we're comparing two values, not for equality, but for ordering. And ordering tells us which symbol goes between them, less than, equal to, or greater than. Now that we have that, we can define order. Right? And so this is another trait with one method on it called compare. And compare takes two a's and produces the ordering between them. And now we can make a new order where we're, um, where we're comparing some persons. And so now we can compare persons not just for equality, but for their ordering. So with, with this power of ordering, now we can go and write sort. Right? We can put quick sort in here or whatever you'd like. And this has an implicit parameter that A must be orderable. Okay? So now if we have a list of persons, 
we can sort them and they'll come out like this. Note that they're first sorted by their age and then only if their ages are the same they will then be sorted alphabetically by name. But then your boss slams through the door and says, Johnson, I need those persons sorted by name. And you say, oh, yes, sir, Mr. Peterson, all right. Um, or whatever you do. And then you have the power of implicits. So it's easy. We just make another ordering for persons. And this one looks at their names first and compares based on that. And if the names are the same, then we'll look at the age. So now you can satisfy the boss and, and order these things the right way. And that's really cool. But now I have a question for you. Oh, and that's an example of that, sorted here by name. So I have a question for you. What happens if we call the sort function with both implicits in scope? Someone tell me what happens. Magic. <laughs> <laughs> so I've heard, I've heard magic. That's pretty accurate. I've heard compiler crashes sometimes. Someone said... We need to define an order for implicits. <laughs> it exists, but I don't think any human understands it. So, the answer is, hopefully, a compiler error. Sometimes. So if they were both defined right on top of each other like this, and then we called it like that, that probably would be a compiler error. But I didn't say they were defined there, I said they were in scope. Do you know which implicits are in scope? I mean, I haven't shown you the imports, but if, for you to answer the question of which implicits are in scope, you would have to go and look through every one of your imports, go to those files, look at all the implicits they define, look at everything they import. It's pretty hard, right? I don't have time to trace, chase implicits all day. Um, but more importantly, we don't know how our persons are going to be sorted. Right? Mr. Peterson might get really mad. <laughs> <laughs> so, it's, so this is, let, yeah. So I'm going to move on to another example. Let's talk about sets. This is, um, see, I write my slides in LaTeX, so I have to have a slide of math to show off. <laughs> so I chose sets. Here's, here's an interface for a basic set data type. We have an empty set, we can insert into the set, and we can determine whether something is an element of the set. And we're go we want these things to be pretty fast. So we'll implement them with a binary search tree, uh, which will, of course, depend on the ordering between these things. And then we'll get really fast lookups, like log n or something, and it'll be awesome. Everyone will think we're data scientists, uh, not, uh, data type wizards. So we'll do that. And so we'll take an implicit ordering whenever we insert an element, or whenever we determine whether something is an element, and we'll use that ordering to efficiently go through the tree. OK. Now that we've already written that data type, uh, so here's an ordering for person, and we're going to make a set of persons. We're just going to do that by repeatedly inserting persons into the empty set. And now we have a set of persons. That's very cool. Now in some other file somewhere else, I want to know if one of those, if a person that I care about is in that set. Oh, and I've got this implicit in scope. So it gives the wrong answer, right? It uses the wrong ordering when it tries to walk through the tree and it says, nope, that person's not there, even though they are. It's just not using the right ordering. This is insanity! <laughs> right? It silently gave me the wrong answer. I can't deal with that. It's crazy. So I have some recommendations when you're using implicits, because I know a lot of people are using Scala. I used to program in Scala all day. Um, I recommend kind of taking a leaf out of the type class book and only creating instances in the same file that defines the type or the type class, in this case the trait. And I would sort of, I would encourage you to disallow the creation of multiple instances and we will enforce this through the tool of code review and discipline and having a good team. <laughs> I'm gen that's like a genuine recommendation. <laughs> But what about implicits in external libraries? I use, like, if, if I were programming Scala, I'd be using all sorts of other libraries to do all sorts of things. So whenever I'm, like, choosing a library, I go through and, among other things, look at how they use their implicits. Um, and if they're using them with some degree of discipline, as I've described, then that's probably a good library and probably good things will happen. Um, not everyone uses them like that. So if you kind of distrust their usage of implicits, you can always pass these things explicitly. 
right? And it's just a, it's like a syntactic burden on you, but you can, you can know what's going to happen. But you know what makes me really happy, right? When I get up in the morning, I'm like, all right, let's go to work and do some awesome stuff. What makes me really happy is compiler errors. <laughs> this is a compiler error from the Haskell compiler, which says, you've given two different orderings for person. Sort it out and try again. And I'll say, oh, yes, sir, Mr. Haskell, and, uh, and go and fix it, right? The like, it, it, it can't pick the wrong ordering because it's going to tell me if there's more than one. It's awesome. And what if I make an orphan instance? Well, it'll say, oh, orphan instances. This is only a warning. But luckily, I compile with dash w error, as I assume all you do. And, um, and so luckily, this is an error as well for me. So I think type classes have some big wins in flexibility, expressiveness, and modularity over some other solutions like interfaces. But they kind of keep things sane with some, some kind of principles, right? We've got this property of coherence. We have a few small restrictions in order to enforce coherence. And those restrictions, most importantly of all, are compiler checked. So type classes are really good. Thanks. I'm not sure. So what, what do you mean? So in Haskell, the idea of the open world assumption is, is that somebody can always later define a class instance. Yeah, yeah that's, that's right. right. So, and some people have complained that this complicates type error diagnosis. Okay. So, um, did you, can you say something about how you like the quality of type error messages when you use type class in Haskell? I don't think I use them in a complicated enough way to get into those situations. I'm not sure. I find that students who write one plus true. Okay, and what what does the compiler say? That, like, that, I don't have an instance that, of num. Boom is not an right. instance of num. Yeah. You get that boom is not an instance of num. That sounds good to me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because they've never heard of instance or a class yet. Yeah, that's true. That's true. So this is so kind of putting error messages on is something we can kind of work on. Right? It's all, I, I was mostly trying to get at the kind of core of it is good. And we can work on our error messages, right? We can go on work on GHC and fix that up. Yeah, that's what I'm doing. Cool. Are you working at GHC? Yeah, cool. I think, I guess you could, I think it would be something to discuss something in a talk like this. Okay. Yeah, because you talk about the core of instances, which I, I'm happy to report. Okay, yeah. So some people actually have lots of old Haskell code around where this was actually a very normal way of using code, you have your classes, you have new data types, and you have a separate module that integrates them, where mm. the instances are. Mm. Right. So yeah, I'm, I'm not a big fan of that. So I was very happy that actually I could turn this warning off, because then I can see the new warnings thing. Um, yeah, and I can turn the warning into an error, and then we're both happy about right? so, it. Yeah. <laughs> of course, I'm afraid at some point they will actually maybe turn that warning into an error. Hmm. They, they think everybody should now modify their code the way that it actually doesn't have more and it's a good test. Then I'm in the shit. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Any other questions? Any easier questions? Yes, not to be very straightforward. So you have this idea of being able to have an instance of a type class that depends on some other uh, type also having an instance of a type class. So you know, when you did the one for uh, equals for the list of A's, mm -hmm. you need to be able to compare A's themselves. That's right. Right. Yeah. So does this also apply to the to the implicits in the sense that since they're passed implicitly, you don't actually need to name them. You don't have to explicitly say use this instance of this uh, comparison or type class or whatever. If you have to make, have to make a call and no instance of that implicit is in scope, this thing just blows up on you, right? Uh, yeah, I don't remember what the compiler error looks like, but yeah, if there's no implicit in scope with the right type, that's a that's a compiler error. So is that a similar idea to constraining something to having instances? 
Cyclops? Yeah. But yeah. it's a little more silent. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's. It, so if there isn't an implicit, then the, then we do get a compiler error. Um, it's more. It's it's not the zero case. It's the many case that I was, yeah. kind of worried about. But yeah. Thanks. I didn't mention that. All right, thank you, Josh.